Hello, everyone. My name is Aristotle Ostrovsky. I'm a human rights attorney and CEO of the International Legal Forum. I am delighted um, and really um, privileged today to have an incredible guest with us uh, as part of an ongoing uh, series of conversations uh, regarding uh, what is happening in Israel uh, with the war against uh, Hamas in Gaza and the various legal international law implications arising out of it. Um, our guest today is Judge Stanislav Pavlovsky, who is an eminent international law expert. He's a former judge of the European Court of Human Rights. He has over 40 years of experience across every level from, um, from law enforcement to criminal investigation to prosecution and even acting as a judge. Um, in particular, he has specialties across the fields of international criminal law, uh, democracy, uh, protection of human rights and the rule of law and fundamental freedoms both uh, in Europe um, and beyond. And certainly, as we've seen from circumstances following the October 7th massacre, we've seen how uh, really a lot of these discussions and legal issues are very much global in nature. Um, he does have a much longer CV, um, but uh, with that, um, and I couldn't do that enough justice, uh, but Judge, I'm so very uh, humbled and privileged, and we certainly wanted to welcome you and have this conversation about your uh, your insights and your experience about what is happening, and uh, also just as importantly about what needs to happen as we move forward. So, welcome uh, once again. It really is a privilege to have you on. Thank you so much for your invitation. It's a pleasure. Um, thank you. Um, I wanted to ask you, first of all, um, you know, you uh, certainly you're someone whose career is embedded in in the norms of international law, uh, certainly within Europe and Europe as a continent, of course, um, you know, we have seen over the last hundred years, you know, some most horrific crimes and none more so than, of course, uh, in World War II um, and the Holocaust. And there's been obviously a number of other um, certainly mass war crimes in the decades uh, that followed since. Um, so what I wanted to ask you is, you know, a lot of the concepts and norms and fundamental structures of international law that we're dealing with today. You know, they are rooted in the Geneva Conventions in 1949. They are rooted in the Nuremberg trials, in, uh, you know, the horrors of what happened out of 19, in the 1940s and 30s from World War II. Even the United Nations as a body was created in the wake of that horrific period. But my question is, you know, is it time for us to maybe change these laws or is it perhaps more important to change the interpretation of how we look at them because those laws uh, and rules were really set when we're dealing with state actors state parties but what we're dealing with today as we can see certainly here is we're dealing with state parties like israel like other democracies fighting non-state actors and terror groups what what is your view you know is it time for a new body of laws or is it perhaps more about how we interpret the, the existing ones yeah, first of, first of all, I guess it would be good to say that uh, this situation shows that uh, international law is not very perfect and it is to be changed, it is to be uh, adduced to the realities of our current day. Because when the United Nations Organization was created, it was immediately after the World War II. The idea behind that was to create a situation where such kind of wars would have never happened again. Never happened again. Unfortunately, Israeli uh, Hamas war shows that uh, the United Nations Organization failed in their, uh, in their realization of their statutory duties. Statutory duties. They failed to uh, to promote preventive di diplomacy, what it is called, preventive diplomacy. They failed to work closely, closely to uh, Hamas leaders. They failed to 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 work closely with those who support that movement. They failed to work closely with the neighbors of Israel, and all these failures taking. Uh, uh, all, to, all together shows that the United Nations they failed in the realization of their statutory duties. And this was the reason why this conflict was possible. Practically, Hamas 
was left without any monitoring, without any supervision on the part of the United Nations organization. They did very many interesting things concerning environment, concerning climate changes. Yes, it is important. I, I, I don't deny this. It is important. But this situation, I mean, Israeli Hamas uh, conflict and war, and war shows that unfortunately we have much, much more important issues to sort out rather than climate changes. Yes, climate changes, changes is important issue. Don't, nobody denies it. But climate changes does not generate dozens, dozens of, of hundreds of victims. Uh, climate changes does not uh, burn down villages, does not kill people, does not rape kids, so on. So we need to, to prioritize things. We need to determine which things are more important right now and how to proceed in a such a manner as to create a situation where such kind of events would have never happened again. And this is the idea behind the creation of the United Nations. And this is the idea behind this conflict, which shows one more time how important it was to raise the question of in, in 1945, when the United Nations organization was created, how important it was now, and how important it, it was then, and how important it is now, nowadays. And of course, uh, uh, as I always say, to express these opinions, you don't need to be, I mean, concerning the need, the need to, to, to make legislation, international law more perfect. You don't need to be big specialist in the field of international law. You don't need to be, to be a big specialist. You need to be honest person. You need to hate those who kill people. You need to hate those who are not able to organize their own life in a civilized way, and they destroy the lives of other people, mm -hmm. innocent, innocent people. You need just to be an honest person to, to, to make these uh, findings, to, um, to understand that without international community as a whole, this problem it simply cannot be put left on the shoulders of the U of Israel only to leave Israel uh, Josh, alone. Can I, to what... yeah. can, I, can I ask you, do you believe that the existing framework of international uh, criminal law, including the Geneva Conventions, do you believe they are sufficient, they're enough for the current circumstances? Um, it just maybe it's just a matter of willpower in terms of applying them, or do you believe perhaps we need a new body? Of law developed in order to deal with uh, with some of the new circumstances that we're dealing with today. That you spoke about some of the specific, obviously, crimes, and we'll talk more about that. That uh, Hamas is uh, has been carrying out, and other non-state actors and terror groups, for that matter. I, I consider, and the last events have shown that this uh, is correct approach. I consider that. Uh, current body of the law is is not sufficient. It's absolutely not sufficient to prevent such kind of, of of events. Because the problem is law. The role role of law is to prevent illegal behavior, mm -hmm. not just to deal with the consequences of criminal activity, mm -hmm. but to prevent to prevent. Because if a person is killed, I'm very sorry. If a person is killed, well, you can give. His relatives, a certain moral damage, ten thousand dollars or one million dollars, but it will not return back that killed person. So the idea is to create the body of the law which would prevent such kind of events. And here we are speaking. Well, criminal law remedies, of course, they are okay, but they are post factum remedies. They are post factum remedies. Criminal law always comes into place, play when somebody has committed a crime and you are punishing that person. This is the role of, of uh, criminal law. But when, uh, when I'm speaking about preventive uh, diplomacy, I'm speaking about the role of international organizations, 
we have very many international organizations where dozens of hundreds of, of people are working, getting very comfortable salary to create a situation which would exclude such kind of, of, of wars, such kind of international crimes. But I cannot call it otherwise, but international crime, what has happened on, on the uh, October 7th. It is what was a clear, clear international crime. A crime uh, from the point of view of international law. But it is not sufficient because international law has clearly failed, failed to prevent such kind of situation. But we should think how to, how to organize uh, international law in such a manner as to, uh, uh, which would have never allowed such kind of events in future. Of you, course. Know, you, you mentioned, Judge, that the role, I think it's important, the role of international organizations. And certainly within Israel, I think there's been a lot of criticism um, in terms of their role here. Take a look, for example, at, you know, the Red Cross. You know, the Red Cross's role is meant to be to uh, visit the, the wounded, uh, the hostages, the prisoners, to give them medicine, uh, provide proof of life. But so far, you know, it's day 74 now for the war and the Red Cross has not seen a single a uh, single Israeli hostage or provided any medicine. You look at an organization like, say, UN Women, the primary uh, body in the United Nations tasked with protecting women's and advancing defending women's rights, but who for over two months said nothing uh, in the face of some most horrific crimes we saw committed against uh, women uh, by Hamas. Um, how, do you how do you explain, you know, that silence? And does it leave these organizations with any credibility um, into the future. Again, we are dealing with one more failure of an international organization. One more failure. Because 200 hostages, which are being kept in a very terrible, awful conditions, is a clear indicator for interference of Red Cross organization. They should have intervened. They should have organized meetings with those who are responsible on the part of Hamas, I don't know the internal organization of this uh, of this movement, but for, for sure there are persons who are leading this organization. So they should have met with these people. They should have required meetings with the hostages. They should have seen the conditions in which the hostages are being kept. They should have uh, guaranteed that hostages have access to uh, quality medical medical care, that they have access to medicamentation, that, that they have access to, uh, to, to food, to water, to other things. Because to the best of my knowledge, uh, uh, there are hostages who died, who died being kept hostages. So At what's least the reason? 20, At least 20 hostages were executed um, in captivity by Hamas, we believe. You see, you see 20 hostages. It's a huge amount of one single life. One single life is a tragedy. One single life. But here, dozens of people are, or uh, several hundreds of people are being kept hostages. All the world is watching. All the world is watching. All the world are witnesses. Uh, of all such kind of things. And nobody is doing anything. Uh, I mean, United Nations organization, Red Cross organization, other international organizations. I guess this is a clearly, they are clear failure and clear indicators that something should be done in order to modernize international law to prevent, in, in order to, uh, to, 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 to transform it into a kind of preventive mean. Preventive means which would uh, not allow such kind of events in the future. And of course, something should be done with what is going on right now. Right now. Uh, I, I understand the uh, civilians from both parties are suffering. I don't want to, to blame population of uh, Palestine. Of course, they have a part of their responsibility because those though they are those who who um, who supported this Hamas movement. This Hamas movement did not uh, appear out of nowhere. This uh, movement is burned by this population. 
and the population was supporting Kita. Now we are seeing we are seeing the results of this uh, uh, activity. And now um, Palest Palestine uh, population they are suffering. They are suffering, but they are suffering not only in the result of the uh, result of these hostilities or military actions. They are suffering as the result of their lack of vigilance from the very beginning. They should think who they are promoting in the position of leaders. They should think what are the modern ways of governing a state uh, formation, a state formation. If you, if you form a, a, a state like organization or state like territorial formation, you should govern it according to the rules of civilized world. And uh, here I see, I see problems. Maybe uh, uh, the role of international organizations is very important because international organizations, even uh, civil society organizations, they should have worked with the population. They should have uh, conducted uh, educational work with the population. Uh, they should have uh, explained to the population how a state should be governed, mm -hmm. what should be allowed, what should not be allowed. Because when all these tunnels have been built, people, ordinary people, they saw or they did, did not see all these activities. Of course, they, they, they saw everything, but they kept silent, silence. Didn't they understand for which reasons these tunnels are built? They didn't understand, but they kept silence. And now there is um, it's very, very painful and, and very difficult question to discuss. Mm -hmm. But you see, there is a note the, the the whole the whole set of problems. And with this set of problems, international organization should have been dealing along at least last 20, 30 years, but they did not, but they did not. And this is the result, this is the consequences. Because each and every, well, of course, as I, as I said, it is a very painful issue, very painful issue. All of us, all, all of us who have hearts, and uh, when we see, uh, when we are seeing uh, people suffering, when we are seeing kids suffering, of course, we cannot be indifferent but we should we should uh, separate two distinguished issues those who are uh, those who are responsible for the appearance of the situation and those who are trying to resolve the situation so two different uh, types of of pure persons uh, two different types of those who are expressing their opinions of course, it is difficult. I, I told you uh, uh, that it is uh, not possible to discuss such, a, uh, such of important issues without emotions. But sometimes emotions, they are not very good um, advisors and uh, they prevent people from judging, from judging objectively on such kind, such kind of things. Okay. I should confess, I, I'm also uh, affected somehow by emotions because I watch TV, I watch Fox News, I watch BBC, I watch CNN, I, was, I, I watch very many other uh, problems, uh, uh, Al Jazeera, and I see what is going on there. And of course, emotions are covering, uh, covering us, but we should forget about emotions, and we should start thinking uh, clearly in terms of international law, we should start thinking clearly in terms of preventive diplomacy. And preventive diplomacy, I, 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 I guess this is the most important issue for the future. Now, of course, um, since all these military actions, they are still, still in place now, I guess international organizations, United Nations organizations, well, they are, they are requesting ceasefire. I understand this fire is the kind of temporary temporary solution. One, two days, three days. It's meant to be a vote at the UN Security Council, I believe, uh, later later today on on the ceasefire, as well. 
Um, well, Jeff, yeah. okay. I, wanted, I, wanted to, I wanted to ask you um, some, a little bit more specific about the international law components, you know, and you spoke, you know, I think what you said about preventative diplomacy is something so important, and that's certainly something that we need to draw out of the events uh, that happened in the last two months is one of the, one of the lessons for, for sure. Uh, but at the same time, and I think as you noted as well, we are also dealing in the in the here and now, and in the what, what transpired in the last two months and moving forward. And you know, it's difficult not to apply some kind of you know we're humans, and you know we see what what's happening. We saw what happened then on October seven from you know massacres, butchering, decapitation, mass rape, burning entire families. Um, you know, and I think most just about every reasonable person in the world, including many world leaders in Europe, America, international community, will, you know, will of course agree that yes, Israel has a right to self-defense. No one would dispute that, including under Article 51, of course, of the UN Charter and customary law. But it seems that every time there's a conflict here, the same people who say Israel has a right to self-defense then immediately criticize Israel, the moment Israel engages in self-defensive actions and one of the first charges that's inevitably always automatically leveled against Israel is that we are acting disproportionately. And, you know, the question sort of, you know, arises in international law, you know, what is proportional? You know, for example, what is proportionate when you fed children, families, women burnt, raped, mutilated, decapitated, you know, what is a proportionate a response? So perhaps you can, uh, you know, in, in, enlighten us because, you know, there is a presumption that proportionality, it's sort of this biblical concept almost of an eye for an eye, one for one, which which is not quite the case. So perhaps you can, uh, you can enlighten us on this important concept. Yes, uh, the problem of self-defense, of self the problem of self-defense, this is a legal, legal problem. A legal, clearly legal problem. Uh, in, in order to speak about self-defense, there should be an attack. Mm -hmm. There is no self-defense without attack. Mm -hmm. So events of October 7th clearly manifest that Israel was under attack. And since Israel was under attack... And it continues a... to be under attack, we should say as well. Sorry, sorry. And we should add probably continues to be under attack. Yeah, yeah. I, 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 just a second, I will continue with this. Yeah. So uh, Israel was clearly under attack on the October 7. Mm -hmm. And uh, accordingly, Israel was in the right to practice self-defense. After that, even now, military actions are taking place from both sides. Even now, Israel is under attack. May, may, maybe the intensity of that attack, Hamas part, maybe it is not equal to, to the intensity of uh, the attack of the 7th uh, of uh, October, but it still exists. And this is, this is justification for Israel to continue this self-defense. Um, of course, Self-defense can, self cannot start immediately after, after uh, the termination of attack. Self-defense is a process, is a process. It cannot be done like, like hope, we are applying self-defense. Hope we have started applying. It, is, it, does not, it simply does not work like that. This is the process, the whole process. Troops are in movement, people, thousands of thousands of military personnel are involved. So it, it cannot be done like that. That simply it, it could be a kind of profanation of, of what this military action is about. It is simply not possible. What, what it comes to uh, proportionality. When, uh, when we are speaking about, about proportionality, again, this is a legal issue. We should understand uh, proportionality not as, uh, for instance, somebody attacks you with a knife and you are uh, entitled to protect yourself using a knife. Mm -hmm. This is again a profanation. If somebody attacks you with a rifle, you are entitled to protect you using a rifle. It is not like that. Mm -hmm. uh, Self-defense and proportionality is uh, the character of danger. Character of danger. If somebody endangers your life, 
you should apply actions which would protect your life and would endanger the life of attacker, attacker, attacker. This is the proportional, what proportionality is about. Uh, danger of, for life, danger of life. And it's interesting it's right here because we have, uh, you know, the Hamas is very open about their intentions and their intentions are very clearly, they say that in their charter and in their uh, statements, their intention is the annihilation of the state of Israel. Then they're very clear about that. Um, that, 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 is, that is their goal. It's the genocide essentially so in in that sense you know you would think that sort of legally speaking israel's entitled to take whatever action in order to ensure its survival yes yes uh, i guess this is uh, this sort of, uh, war is a kind of uh, uh, existential war for israel because uh, this is the reality i don't want to exaggerate uh, things but this is the reality you are living in, in a hostile environment a hostile environment. I guess you have already had more than six wars. More than six wars. I guess this is one is the seventh or eighth war. So in a very, very short history, very short history, Israel started in 40, uh, 47, 48 period. Even we don't have even 100 years of existence. And in this very short period of time, you have already had a lot of wars. A lot of wars. Why? Because people are thinking about one simple thing: how to annihilate Israel, how to destroy this state, how to. Well, I don't want to use all these very tough words, you know. But you are in a very tough environment, and this kind of war, this is a, an existential war. This is a war for your survival. I would put it in this way. This is a war for your survival, for the survival of your people, for the survival of your state, for the survival of your nation. And here, political leadership is uh, responsible is responsible for the destiny of your people, and your political leadership is responsible for the fate of your state. So they are doing what they consider that it should be done in such kind of situation, how to protect people, how to protect the state? Protect the state. They are doing this. At least I'm live. I'm living in. I'm living in Moldova. Moldova is uh, two, three thousand kilometers far from Israel. But even here, we feel we feel the consequences of this of this war. And we understand that. Uh, we understand how, do you, that how do you feel that? How do you see that? And the, the reason the reason I wanted to perhaps ask you that is, you know, we have seen now. On the streets of Europe, um, especially London, France, uh, North America, you know, Canada, US as well, and elsewhere, you know, we see this protest, almost support for Hamas, and uh, you know, from my belief, and uh, you know, I'd love to hear your opinion. You know, a lot of that emanates certainly from the from this kind of very pervasive discourse and discussion rooted in legal terms as well. You know, when uh, when those on the in the press or international organizations like UN and others are accusing Israel of committing these, you know, crimes without any substance while overlooking what Hamas is doing, you know, this sort of energizes these mobs to go out on the street to show support for Hamas. And as we've also seen, this kind of rhetoric then results in also violence against Jewish communities as well. Well, it's a very, very interesting question. Interesting and at the same time, very difficult question to answer. Uh, I would say, at least this is my feeling. Maybe I'm wrong. I'm not a, a big specialist in Middle East uh, uh, realities and, and affairs, but my feeling is that Israel should pay more attention to, to inform, information activities. Information war, if you wish. Maybe it is not a good term, but uh, it is sufficient to open internet and to see uh, how many TV channels, TV channels are promoting the Hamas cause and how many TV channels are prom promoting Israel's cause. Just try to do this balancing exercise. And you will see that there you have hundreds of TV channels from very rich countries, 
being paid by rich countries and where they are able to invite the best possible journalists to promote the work course. And here Israel is practically alone in this field of activity. I tried to find the Israeli TV channels in English. And I failed. Unfortunately, I failed. There is a, a radio. There are some radio channels. There are some radio channels. One of them. One of them is even in Russian. One of them is in English. But it is clearly not sufficient. And people, I mean, those who are protesting, protesting. Of course, they are entitled to protest. Each of us are free to protest. But you need to protect. You, you need to protect. A noble, a noble cause, a noble cause. Uh, those who triggered this war, those who raped kids, those who killed people, they are responsible. I'm very sorry. They are responsible. They are triggered all these activities. Not Israeli forces entered in Gaza and started killing Palestinians. It was not like that. Simply was not like that. But to say that, well, of course, yes, they raped, they killed, they uh, murdered, they took hostages, but it is okay. Let us make a demonstration in their support. In my view, it is simply not correct. And to be, to be um, a person who would object to such kind of things, you, you, do, you don't need to be a big specialist in law. You need to be an honest person. You need to be a person able to, 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 um, to call a spade a spade, to call a spade a spade. You need to be able to, to distinguish between victim and uh, those who killed that victim. To, to put them on the same scales to say that victims and their killers, well, okay, they, they are the same. It is not simply not correct. So I would, uh, uh, I would say that uh, simple people, before going and protesting and, uh, and uh, demonstrating, they should understand what things they are trying to, to, to promote what things they are trying to promote. And uh, I would, I would organi organize one single protest, the protest against the United Nations, which have clearly failed, clearly failed in, in the in fulfillment of their statutory duties, clearly failed. And even now, even now, I don't know, may, maybe you can correct me. The Secretary General of the United Nations, did he meet uh, the leaders of Hamas? Do, did they have a conference with the Hamas leaders trying uh, to... No, I don't believe he's met the leaders of Hamas, um, but he certainly meets frequently with the Palestinian Authority. He actually only just yesterday saw the video of... There's a 47-minute video of the... Unedited video of the most heinous uh, the crimes uh, committed by Hamas which many around the world, lawmakers, uh, media have seen it, but he has only he only saw that just now, yesterday. And, you know, for Israel, I think it's important that when we go to the early on in the in the in this particular war, when uh, Antonio Guterres, Secretary General, had said in his words that, um, you know, on the one hand, condemning what Hamas did, but then saying that you cannot look at this in a vacuum, which is something preposterous because you know there can never be any justification obviously for the kinds of uh, atrocities and crimes um, and crimes that, that we saw so certainly from Israel's perspective and by the way even all these resolutions about ceasefires including one that's been happen today not once not once they even mentioned Hamas the very party that perpetrated that instigated these attacks and the very same party that stands to benefit the most from the attacks because if there is a cessation it allows them time to rearm and reposition um, them, themselves but I, I wanted to ask also judge I mean uh, we have time for perhaps two more questions um 
One, uh, one I wanted to ask you, I'm not sure if you saw it yesterday, and there's been a lot of discussion, for example, about um, hospitals in Gaza and when Israel has been forced to take certain military operations in and, in and around them. Um, now, we know that, you know, under international law, including Geneva Conventions, Article 18 and elsewhere, you know, uh, civilian sites such as uh, hospitals, they are sacrosanct. They have special protected status, which means that, you know, you cannot target them for those reasons. But there are also circumstances, including under those same rules and regulations, that provide exceptions, uh, including when these um, hospitals become military structures and used by uh, organization terror groups as command centers and something we've seen with Hamas during this war during past wars as well and there was actually an interview just last night uh, it's a very important interview with a man by the name of Kamal Adwan uh, sorry uh, that's sorry <laughs> that's not his name uh, but he was a director of the Kamal Adwan hospital in Gaza one of the main hospitals then in the interview which was an interrogation after he was caught he actually uh, said that and admitted to the fact that the hospital, including the ambulance services, were used for military activities and that even some of the doctors and nurses were involved in this. So uh, my, my question really to you is, you know, under the international legal framework, you know, are these legitimate circumstances when Hamas turns these hospitals into, you know, tunnels and storage for weapons and uh, terrorists and command centers, does that turn it into a legitimate military target in those cases? Well, the question is again very, very, very difficult, difficult, but I guess the answer is yes. The Hamas, Hamas is not entitled to the, under the international laws. Hamas is not entitled to use hospitals to um, to reach their military, military ends. They're simply not entitled. Mm -hmm. And if they start doing so, this would justify application force on the part of Israel, uh, application force to them, even even if they are uh, hiding uh, behind these uh, uh, hospitals. So they are taking all the responsibility for possible consequences on the part of the Israel, of the Israel uh, defense forces. So uh, this is their responsibility. And, uh, I guess it's totally unacceptable, totally unacceptable to use protect, protected uh, objectives, to use them for their military ends. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I personally consider it a kind of uh, uh, military crime, military crime. Um, I wanted to ask perhaps uh, last, uh, last question. Now we, it's, uh, you know, I, I think that since October 7, and uh, we've said in the period ongoing now, I think you know every conceivable international law, every war crime, uh, genocide, crimes against humanity uh, that is uh, that has ever been envisaged, Hamas has violated it from indiscriminately targeting civilians, a rocket fire, rape, pillaging, uh, mutilation, burning of uh, burning entire families, taking of hostages, which they're still keeping. Every conceivable international law. So my, my question to you, and perhaps the last question, is someone who has your experience, including as an investigator, as a prosecutor, and as a judge, and certainly within Europe and elsewhere, how do we hold Hamas accountable um, under international law? You know, there are different mechanisms from international tribunals, perhaps another Nuremberg, we saw what happened in Yugoslavia, there's the United Nations, but of course we question what their uh, integrity and capability, uh, there are different principles under universal jurisdiction and elsewhere, um, you know, and it's not only Hamas, it's also some of their supporters, including whether it's Iran, Qatar and others, but in your view, in terms of when you spoke about preventative diplomacy also, you know, how do we make a lesson and how do we hold specifically, how do we hold Hamas accountable for the crimes which they perpetrated. Yes, there are two. There are two possibilities: individual responsibility of uh, persons who have committed crimes, individual responsibility, and second, uh, responsibility of the Hamas as a legal entity, as a collective body. Um, both of these types of responsibilities are applicable. 
if uh, uh, responsibility of private individuals is more or less a simple issue because this is the general jurisdiction of uh, of general courts, uh, then the uh, responsibility of Hamas as an entity is a little bit more difficult. For this uh, issue, you need to have you need to have international support. You need to have support on the part of uh, public opinion. Public opinion. Uh, for that, you need to create a correct public opinion. You need to inform correctly um, public opinion of other countries. Uh, and here I'm speaking about internet resources, I'm speaking about television, I'm speaking about newspapers. You need to, to, to publicize uh, your course, you need to, and to, you need to show people from other countries who is responsible, who was the person who created this, this very regrettable situation. And uh, once this public opinion is created, you can you can uh, uh, move to the next next step. You can uh, negotiate with with um, uh, representatives of other uh, states, other countries, trying to to get support on their side. Uh, I, I I am sure that you will get the support. And after that, having public opinion on your side and having the support on the part of other international states, you can organize an international conference, international conference uh, during which uh, all the issues would be discussed. And uh, as a result of this conference, there should be a suggestion, or there should be a resolution or decision uh, on, on the creation of international tribunal. And after that, you need to you need to uh, create uh, the statute of the tribunal. You need to create uh, rules of law for the tribunal. You need to create uh, staff of the tribunal. Well, the best, the are there any tribunals the in the last say couple of decades um, that you think might be we can draw uh, lessons from, whether from Yugoslavia or others, uh, certainly some in Europe um, and elsewhere. Nuremberg, of course, going back to 40, uh, to the end of uh, the Second World War as well. You know, are, are there lessons to be drawn from some of those as well in terms of how to apply them here? Yes and no. Yes and no. Yes, um, because such kind of tribunals, they have a very good experience, which can be used, which can be used. But on the other hand, all these tribunals, they have been dealing with the conflicts between states, between mm -hmm. states. While here in this situation, on the one part we have a state, that's the state of Israel. On the other part we have a kind of uh, non-state formation, non-state organization, a kind of terrorist, uh, terrorist organization. Uh, to the best of my memory, recollection, I don't uh, remember such kind of international tribunals which would have dealt with such kind of uh, situations. I guess it will be it will be the first time in the human history creation of such kind of tribunals. Can I, can then, I ask you also, you know, for example, you know, we have also the International Criminal Court in the in the Hague, and the court was created specifically, you know, to deal with some of the worst crimes in mankind, genocide, crimes against humanity, uh, war war crimes. Um, but there are also some concerns with the way the ICC operates, and you know, certainly Israel and the United States, the two countries that did not sign on to the Rome Statute because of concerns that it has become politicized, and we saw that. I think, you know, a couple of years ago when the court opened an investigation and that it declared Palestine a state, which, you know, contrary, I think, to a lot of existing principles and norms of law. Um, so, you know, there's also a question, you know, can we um, have respect or can we trust the court, such as the ICC, to investigate this in an impartial, um, in an impartial manner? Or is it even, you know, the best mechanism or the correct mechanism for this, do you think? You know, when you when you are going to a, a, a tribunal which has already been accepted, to some extent you lose the situation from your control. You are not controlling the situation. You need to you will you will need to accept you will need to accept decision delivered by the people in reference to which you don't have uh, trust. Mm -hmm. You don't have you don't trust them. 
as you have just mentioned yourself. You don't trust them, but you go to them and are asking them for justice and agree to accept their decision. There's a kind of contradiction between uh, such kind of things. I guess, uh, and situation is not usual. Situation mm -hmm. is not usual. As I told you, here we are speaking about the state of Israel, which is state in the direct sense of this war. Here we are speaking about a kind of terror, terrorist organization. Mm, I don't have uh, uh, knowledge concerning such kind of uh, things in the human history. I guess this would be first time in the human history. Uh, so you will need you will need to go along the whole path from the very beginning, starting from, as I said, creating favorable public opinion and form of, uh, forming the composition of this court, creating a clear and fair rules, and uh, after that, uh, conducting uh, conducting investigations, conducting prosecutions between because being former public prosecutor and being former public for, for a criminal investigator. I hate the very idea to, to prejudge uh, the conclusions. We cannot say that somebody is guilty, somebody is not. We need to conduct objective investigation. We need to, co to, co to collect the body of uh, evidence and after that make our conclusions, but not to make conclusions right now and after that, to start collecting evidence confirming this conclusion. It is not correct. It would be a kind of wishful thinking, a kind of wishful thinking. I, I don't like this, this idea. You need to preserve appearances of impartial approach. Very important for your state. I guess that along your not very long history, you have manifested that you are um, in favor of democracy, you are in favor of rule of law, you are in favor of justice, and I would suggest you should go uh, along this path in the future as well, and uh, dealing with Hamas, whatever your personal opinion is, you need to select uh, judges who are impartial and independent, and you should, uh, you should select ju judges to whom you have trust, and after that, you should leave this issue in your hands. But to give this issue in the hands of people in the reference to which you, from the very beginning, don't have the full trust, I guess it will not be serious. Simply will not be serious. Judge, um, I think uh, on that note, um, we might end the conversation, which I have to say has been enlightening and very Certainly edu educational, I think, as we said, you know, this is a war in many ways. There are wars that are being fought uh, between troops on the ground and certainly between lawyers and in legal arenas and courtrooms as well. And I think we've uh, been greatly enriched by your experience and your insight and uh, and uh, judgments on this. Thank you so much for, for your time and uh, certainly for, uh, for all that you've, uh, you've done and um, for all that you've uh, shared with us during this conversation. So thank you so much again. You're welcome. I wish all the best to Israel.